Amen. Praise God. For those of you that maybe come from a, you know, a different kind of background and aren't really used to all that, just to let you know, I mean, what we believe, we believe in Pentecost. And what we believe is, is that, I mean, you know, my message wasn't about this, but real quick, just to explain it. We, we believe that there's a second work of grace that takes place after salvation. And that second work of grace is a gift. It's the gift that Jesus spoke of. He said it was the gift of the Father. When he told the disciples, see, they had already been born again. It would take me a while to go through and show you all the scriptures. But the disciples that had walked with Jesus had already been born again. And the Holy Spirit, as soon as Jesus died, uh, the Holy Spirit, well, as soon as Jesus died and rose again, he says, he said, he breathed on them and said, receive ye the Holy Spirit. Amen. But it was after that. That Jesus told them before he ascended into heaven, he said, tarry, which means to wait. Wait for me in Jerusalem. And he said, and wait until the gift of my father comes upon you. He said, for you will be witnesses for me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the outermost parts of the earth. And his Bible says that 120 of them were up in the upper room and that the Holy Spirit descended upon them on the day of Pentecost. And like tongues of fire that lit upon their head and they all began to speak with other tongues. Amen. And that was signifying that the, that the birth of the church had taken place and that, and that the Holy Spirit was filling them up. And that the purpose for this power was so that you and I could be witnesses. Now, I've got to tell you something. You don't really want to go to a church where there's no Holy Spirit. You don't want to hear a preacher where there's no Holy Spirit. You don't want mu music ministers that are not going to ever be led by the Holy Spirit to have the Holy Spirit flowing in the midst of a service. You don't want to try to live your life lacking the Holy Spirit. Now, i got to tell you, when you get saved, the Holy Spirit comes to live in your heart. That's right. Amen. But you want more of the yeah. Holy Spirit. Trust me when I tell you, you, you want more of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You, you and I will never accomplish what God is calling us to accomplish. Uh, on our own. We're not going to do that, my friend. Our arms are short. <laughs> you can't reach down in the valley as much as you want to. As much as you should want to help your brother along the side of you to continue to walk with the Lord, your arms are short, my friend. The arm of the Lord is not too short like the sister told yes. us, right? So you get filled with the Holy Ghost. The next thing you know, you start to operate in gifts. Now, I want you to understand this. Then This is what we believe in. This is the problem most Pentecostals have. The problem is that they don't understand the difference between the, the initial baptism and the initial speaking in other tongues, which is evidence that you got the baptism of the Holy Spirit versus the gift of tongues. See, two different things. Everybody that's baptized with the Holy Spirit does not necessarily operate in the gift of tongues and the gift of interpretation of tongues. Some people operate in other giftings of the Holy Spirit. This, the gift of discernment, the gift of wisdom, the gift of faith. Some people operate in the gift of prophecy. They operate in the gift of tongues. They operate in the gift of interpretation of tongues. They operate in the gift of healing. Not everybody operates in every single gift. However, let me make this clear. The God, it is God's will that every believer be filled with the Holy Ghost right. and be able to speak in other tongues. I believe that. It's God's will that you get filled. Now, Oh, I don't want to be walking down the street and then all of a sudden I start jerking and shaking and, and can't control. But no, no, no. The Holy Spirit, he wants to be, he, he, the Holy Spirit don't want people thinking that you're a weirdo, man. Come on, somebody, help me out. The Holy Spirit doesn't want people thinking that you're a weirdo. The Holy Spirit wants people thinking, wow, look at the stability in this guy. Look at this dude's backbone. Look how this guy can stand up in the midst of the trial, in the midst of the, in the crazy world that's going on. Man, I need to grab a hold of some of this. Yeah, that's right. I was looking. Yeah, you might come across a little peculiar at times. <laughs> I know I already said this once, but I, I asked Danielle to go back and look at a video. I don't even, it was the one I did on Mardi Gras. And she was reading the comments to me. I guess she felt like beat me up a little bit. And she says, because it was a big deal for me, right? Because I get like 10 views on the video. But this one's been lingering around out there for a little while. So there's like 5,000 views. I'm like, oh. So she starts reading the little comments. And this lady says, he's crazy. The things that he's saying are crazy. Look at him. He's acting crazy. Something's wrong with him. You know, because I was talking about the fact that Mardi Gras is a pagan holiday of garbage. 
Come on. Right. It's, it's the worship of pagan gods. It's in the book of Galatians. The word is revelry. If you look up the word revelry, it says that frolicsome and drunken fellows in the midnight hour go out and they honor Bacchus, the god of revelry. Come on, dude. That's Mardi Gras. It's not cool to be part of it. Why did I get on that? I don't know. Maybe you needed to hear that. You ain't supposed to be celebrating Mardi Gras, my friend. Is it okay when I tell you that? You do what you want to do. All you watching on video, all you in this place, live your life however you want to live your life. But don't come up in this church if you think this preacher ain't going to tell the truth. And the more I tell the truth, the more free I feel like continuing Amen. to tell the truth. Amen. Hallelujah. And we still got some folks that want to hear the truth. The only reason you ought to be in a Mardi Gras parade is if you got some Christian literature in your hand and you walk around telling people, hey, I just want you to know Jesus. Amen. That's it. Now, I'm not telling you that you got to go. The last time I went to, it wasn't even a Mardi Gras parade. It was a St. Patrick's Day parade in Mississippi. And there was a church and they were hosting a witnessing event. Now, listen, you, you might witness different than I do, right? <laughs> and I got to be honest with you. When I get up here, boy, I just let it all hang out. But when I witness on the street, I'm a little bit different. Okay, I'm just being real with you. I don't have a problem with somebody with a megaphone. I don't. I just don't. Me personally, in the secret sensitive world that we live in, most people don't like megaphone preachers. Okay, but I don't personally have a problem with a megaphone, but I got to be honest with you. The way that I feel led to witness to people on the street is not the way that I saw this dude do. And he was walking through the street before the parade. If you don't give your heart to Jesus, you're going to burn in hell. And so, and they were all just like, and it's true. Everything that the dude was saying was completely true. If you don't give your heart to Jesus, according to the word of God, you will burn for eternity in the devil's hell. The word of God says that the smoke of your torment will rise up in the night and God will see it and he will be there. And you will know because God will be in the presence. David said, even though if I make my bed in hell, you will be there. God will know each and every eternal soul. He don't want no eternal souls in hell. Right. You, you believe that? He bankrupted heaven of his most prized right. possession and he gave us Jesus to die, to pay the penalty for your sin, to pay the penalty for my sin so that we would not have to be judged for our sin. Instead, Jesus was judged for our sin. But I got to tell you that whenever I go street with us and I don't sound like that, typically what I want to do is I go up to him. I'm like, hey man, I'm just curious, what, what do you think? Well, I don't think that somebody ought to be walking around like that guy. I said, well, you know what? I don't feel led to do it that way, but guess what? It seems like he loves the Lord, but I'm just, I'm just curious. What do you think about you? You see? And then I can just open up a conversation, and, and, and you know, I don't even know why I'm getting into all that. <laughs> why did I get into that? I don't know. Because that woman said he's crazy. That's what it was on that Mardi Gras video. And you ain't supposed to be in no Mardi Gras parade unless you're telling people about you. That's my opinion. My opinion based on the scripture. Amen. Amen. All right. But you came here this morning to worship the Lord. I don't know about you, but I really enjoyed that uh, that song service this morning. It was great having additional musicians and being able to spread it out. Amen. Drummers and bass players and putting Rich on the guitar. Amen. It was good, man. That sounded good on one of those songs. Sounded really, really good. Praise God. Well, look, so we're going to be in Matthew chapter 26, verse 38. And uh, I'm going to be bouncing around a little bit. In my message this morning, I did want to say something, though, because I was just feeling this during the song service this morning. And then it kind of really, I think, in a way, maybe it went along with the word that Angie had brought. And so, look, just to kind of finish off what I was saying about Pentecost and about being baptized in the Holy Spirit and the operation of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Every now and then the Holy Spirit will break through in the midst of a service and he'll say, you know, this is what I want to say. And what the Lord wanted to say through the gift of tongues and the gift of interpretation of tongues this morning is he sees where you are. Amen. Mm -hmm. and he knows you might be in a valley and the valley may be very deep. And a lot of times if we're honest with one another and the preachers, I'm, I try to be very honest with you, even about myself. A lot of times when we find ourselves in a deep, deep valley, guess what? We kind of took the pathway down there ourselves. I'm not saying that it never happens that a person that's doing nothing but preaching the gospel and living their life for God doesn't end up in a prison cell. It does happen. But usually in modern day Christianity, most of the time when we find ourselves down there wallowing in a valley, we kind of like found our, we did, we helped get yes. ourselves there. But guess what? It don't matter how we got there. You, you need to understand is that the arm of the Lord is not too short to reach down there and Amen. to grab a hold of yeah. you and he will. Amen. One of the things that I wanted to tell you though, that was 
for my heart before we got into this was a time whenever I was in a very, very low valley. Mm -hmm. All right. And I got to tell you that this is even, and I've shared my story before, but this was even after Christianity. This was 12 years after Christianity. You know, before Christianity, I've told the story. I was a high school dropout. I, I was bound by, by drugs and alcohol. I was bound by the party lifestyle. I just wanted one more high. I wanted one more flesh fest. I wanted one more whatever. And, and then, I, thank God, my sister had told me about the gospel. And I got saved, okay? But, but after 12 years of mediocre Christianity, you know, and I, I was exposed to this message about receiving more of the Holy Spirit. And I would go up for prayer. I don't really feel like I had it. I feel like I felt coerced into trying to act like I did. Maybe it's nobody's fault. I'm just telling you. I'm just being honest with myself. Okay. And after 12 years of trying to live the life, I had fallen back into lust. I had fallen back into alcohol. I had fallen and I was hiding it because you know what? I was ashamed of it. And so I was hiding it behind the scenes. You know, I'd rather somebody be a little bit ashamed about the stuff that they're doing and trying to hide it than to just be flamboyant about it and be throwing it out there. Because at least if you're kind of hiding it, you don't feel real good about it, right? Because you should, listen, we should be convicted of whenever our lives are contrary to the word of the Lord. Amen. We should be convicted by the Holy Spirit. We should not completely feel comfortable living in darkness and sin Amen. because the Holy Spirit lives on the inside of us. And anyway, I found myself in a really dark place again after knowing Christ, you know, spiritually dark. I wasn't as bad off, but or maybe I was worse because I had already known the Lord. And, and, and then I ended up in a barroom bathroom after my sister had died. Okay, my sister died tragically. Most of y'all know the story. My sister had taken her life. And, 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 it, and it was so painful. So painful. I can't, listen to me. If you haven't even, maybe you've experienced something like that. I don't know. But if you haven't, you know, I can't even tell you the flood of thoughts that have entered, that entered my mind. The way, the way that it made me feel. But I'm going to try to keep it simple. Up until that point, you got to understand, I was raised by a man that was in the Marine Corps. He was in Korea. He's in the Hall of Fame. Why do I say all that? Because I'm just trying to tell you a little bit about my story. He's in the Hall of Fame for football at UL. He was tough. He'd rather go to a ballroom and slap another man in the face just for what for whatever, just because that's just the you know kind of person that he, not not that he went out looking for that, but he was hoping that somebody was going to want him to slap them. You understand what I'm saying? <laughs> and, and that's how he that's how he lived his life. And, 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 you know, and so he raised me in such a way that you never showed weakness. You never cry tears. B boy, you think you got something to cry about now? You about? And so I grew up in this, this world where men don't cry, where, where men are tough and crying is a sign of weakness and showing emotion is a sign of weakness. And, and I love my old daddy. I mean, he's, he's gone on and I believe he's with the Lord. He did, you know, he raised his hand a few times like he wanted Jesus. And I, and I believe God's merciful. I hope he's with the Lord. I hope. Okay. But, but, I, but I do know this, you know, he was over there drowning his sorrows, my friend. Okay, yeah, and then after he, 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 he was struck by, the, by, you know, however it was, I believe it was the Lord, he got off the juice. Okay, but guess what? He still wasn't, wasn't real. He still had some, some stuff going on, right? Okay, but, 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 but the point that I'm trying to make is, is this, is that I had known the Lord. I found myself in darkness. I was trying to muster up the strength just to take one more step, just to make it through. You know how many Christians are living their life like that? That's right. Oh, I got to just dig deep down and I'm going to make it happen, Captain, and all them. Get her done. Pull yourself up by the bootstraps. No, no. It don't work like that, dude. Yes. Yes. Satan is a formidable foe. Satan will destroy your life. He, listen to me. He will make and dangle this pretty little thing in front of you and make it look so tasty and sweet. And you won't even think it's all that bad. And then you just crack that door open and the next thing you know, you got way more on your plate than you can handle. You hear me? And I found myself in the midst of that broken and despair and God showed up and he spoke to me. Boy, this is a long story because you know what I really wanted to tell you is? The next morning I woke up and I said, Lord, I can't do this. Come on. I can't do it. I said, this is a simple message. I'm probably going to get deeper than some preachers today, but this is a simple message. I can't do it. Yeah, that's right. It was like yeah. surrender. You hear what that's I'm trying right. to say? That's a, whenever people lift their hands in the air, I'm just letting you know, all we're supposed to really be, we just surrender our yeah. life to the Lord. Yes, 
God's worthy of glory and honor and praise no matter what you're going through this morning, my friend. And, 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 you know, you and I all need to learn how to worship him because he's worthy. Amen. Yeah. Anyway, I said, Lord, I can't do it. I've been trying to do it. My friend. If you don't do it, it ain't going to get done. I want you to do it, Lord. And when I did that, something happened in that moment that was different from everything else. Now I understand. Now I call it the message of the cross. I call it the message of the new covenant. I call it the message of the New Testament. I call it the fact that the old man born of Adam has died in Christ, has been buried with him, and that a new man has been resurrected to newness of life. I was sharing with some guys at the Teen Challenge in Dodson last night. God ain't into rehab, my friend. God's into recreation. He killed the old man. Hallelujah. And he resurrects a new man. And that's how it's supposed to work right there. Yeah. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. And you know what the Lord taught me in these next few months? The value of crying in his presence. I'm not recommending that you walk around in public crying in front of everybody, especially if you're a man. But I recommend the value of you learning how to get broken in the Amen. presence of God, just you and him. However you do it, if you can play guitar... I'm not trying to be mean musicians, but shame on you if you don't ever play your guitar in a closet when nobody else is around. And it's just you and the Lord. Because if I could play guitar, I'd be playing me a song to the Lord. <laughs> and you know what? If you can't play guitar, you need to put a song on. That's what you need to do with your musical gift, by the way. Let me just say that. I'm not going to keep looking at y'all because that ain't going to make you feel weird. But all of you <laughs> musicians, what y'all need to do with y'all's musical gift is give it back to him. Yeah. Hallelujah. Because he gave it to you. And, and for you that can't play music, give your heart back to him and you can use somebody else's music. And you know, I'm just trying, don't even try to worry about getting your wife or your husband to come do it with you. Yeah. Oh, he don't even believe in marriage. You don't get what I'm trying to say. Get your own heart right. Yeah, yeah. Get your own heart. Get my heart right with the Lord. Amen. And then whenever we do that, the Lord's going to start working. Amen. He's going to start working. And you know, I learned some very powerful things in those days. I need to probably revisit them. Not only probably, I need to. I need to revisit and to be reminded about brokenness in the presence of God and about worshiping Him and telling Him. You know, sometimes it's just a matter of putting that music on when nobody else is around. And you know what you do? You just start telling Him. Quit, quit. I'm not saying don't ever bring your problems to the Lord. But He can already see your problems, my friend. You know what I'm saying? Like my prayer distinctly changed whenever I woke up that morning. And I... I I didn't know, I realized now I didn't know how to pray. I realized now I didn't know how to worship. That's why I'm taking a little bit of time with this. Because I want to encourage you. The Holy Spirit taught me some things. In those 5 o'clock, 4.30, 4 o'clock morning uh, encounters that I had with God for several months. And just putting worship music on before I even understood the Word of God. <laughs> you got to understand something. There was a day when I didn't know the Word of God. And I was just this broken man. And, and, and listen, there was some power that was happening in those moments. And what I want is the mixture of both. Yes, Lord. See, I want to be broken in the presence of the Lord, and I want to have the Spirit of God moving and operating along with the Word of God. <clears throat> and, and, and what would happen is I'd put that worship music on, and I'd feel the presence of God, and sometimes I wouldn't even feel the presence of God. I want you to know he's just one whisper away. And I'd be beginning to call upon him, and I'd begin to say, thank you. Yes. Oh, come on, somebody. You ought to just be able to feel that. Thank you. Thank you for what? Thank you that I was a sinner, but you yes, said, Thank you, Lord, that you were obedient to the Father and that you died. Yes. Thank you for shedding your blood for me. Yes. Thank you for loving me, Lord. Yes. Thank you for that even in spite of myself. Now use me, Lord. Fill me up. Don't let me waste another day. Don't let me squander another minute. Don't let me become complacent in this world and in this life that I'm living. And I just get caught up in the busyness of life. And I never, ever, ever let anybody know about your goodness and your love and your mercy and your grace. Lord, please don't let me squander another minute of time. Yes. Sometimes we can, we can get tired. Mm -hmm. Apostle Paul said, don't sleep. Those that sleep, sleep in the dark. Those that get drunk, get drunk in the dark. Work while it is day, the Lord said. Work while it is day. Because when the darkness comes, when no man can work. I don't know about you, but I don't want to live in darkness. Amen? Amen. So what was the message? The message was, I'm encouraging you to get along with the Lord. Shelby, Rich, Jeff, Manny. I'm encouraging y'all to get y'all's guitar and get along with the Lord. Say, if y'all know what's going on, she'll hear it emanating from underneath the door. 
Oh, that's in the man. He's worshiping the Lord. He's singing to Jesus. Amen. It'll be a beautiful thing. You'd be surprised. You get in the habit of that. Dude, the Holy Spirit will start flowing out from underneath that door, and your wife or somebody's going to get blessed. Amen. When they hear it. That's right. Praise God. I believe that. All right. That's what I believe. Mm -hmm. Amen. The message this morning is titled, See His Heart is Broken. Or can you see his broken heart? So we're going to read several passages of scripture. And then I'm going to give you the main point that I feel like the Lord wanted me to share with you. So starting in Matthew chapter 26. We're going to read uh, verse 38. Starting in verse 38. Excuse me. Verse 38 through 50 to start with. It says, then says he unto them, my soul is exceeding sorrowful. Even unto death, tarry ye here and watch with me. And he went a little further and fell on his face and he prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And he comes unto the disciples and finds them asleep. and says unto Peter, What, could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. The spirit is indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away again the second time and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if this cup may not pass away from me, except I drink it, your will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. And he left them and went away again and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Then cometh he to his disciples and says unto them, Sleep on now and take your rest. Behold. The hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. Behold, he is at hand that does betray me. And while he yet spoke, lo, Judas, one of the twelve, came, and with him a great multitude with swords and staves. Staves is another word for sticks. From the chief priests and elders of the people. Now he that betrayed him gave them a sign, saying, Whomsoever... I shall kiss <clears throat> the same as he. Hold him fast. Means cling to him, grab him. And forthwith he came to Jesus and said, Hail, Master, and kissed him. And Jesus said unto him, Friend, wherefore are you come? Wherefore are you come? Or why are you coming? Then came they and they laid hands on Jesus and took him. Now, can we fast forward to verse 55? <laughs> of chapter 26. <clears throat> In that same hour said Jesus to the multitudes, all these people that came to get him, are you come out as against a thief with swords and staves to take me? I sat daily with you teaching in the temple and you laid no hold on me. But all this was done that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples forsook him and fled. It was prophesied in Zechariah, by the way, that if you strike the shepherd, then the sheep would flee. In other words, his, talking about Jesus in the day that they would take him, that his disciples would run and leave him alone. So all the disciples, I want you to see that, all the disciples forsook him and they fled away. All right, Matthew 26, 58. But Peter followed him afar off unto the high priest's palace and went in. And sat with the servants to see the end. Now we're going to fast forward to Matthew 27, 21 through 25, starting in verse 21. So we see it looks like Peter's, Peter's staying strong is what it looks like. Now the governor answered and said unto them, I'm sorry, I missed, the, I missed my spot. Let me just tell you what happened. Peter follows behind, but then he runs into the damsel or the young lady by the fire. And she says, I saw you. I, I saw you with him before. No, 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 no. I, I don't know. I don't know this man. And then they, they and then they, they keep going. And then, and then no, no, no. I, I saw you with him. No, I don't know him. And then, and then they say it again. And he starts. The, the Bible says he starts cursing. He says, "I'm telling you, I don't know the man." Luke says, and actually, it was interesting because I was in a conversation with one of those guys at that place last night, and I thought he was. I thought it was just from the Passion of the Christ, but I went back and looked in the Gospel of Luke to prove that Jesus was right. In the Gospel of Luke, it says that Jesus looked at Peter right after he denied him the third time and the, the rooster started to crow. 
So what I want you to know is, is that it looked like Peter was doing, man, Peter's following along. He might be having it done enough. He, he left him. Matthew 27, 21 through 25. The governor answered and said unto them. So now we have the crowd. Which of these two would you that I would release to you? And they said, Bar Barabbas. Pilate says unto them, well, what shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? They all say unto him, let him be crucified. And the governor said, why? What evil has he done? But they cried out the more. They said, let him be crucified. When Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but rather that a tumult or a, a bunch of chaos was going to break out. He took water and he washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. See you to it. And then the crowd answered and said, his blood be on us and on our children. Now the crowd has turned their back. Matthew 27, 38 through 44. Matthew 27, starting in verse 38. Then there were two thieves crucified with him. One on the right hand and the other another on the left and they that passed by reviled him wagging their heads and saying you that destroys the temple and rebuilds it in three days why don't you save yourself if you are the son of god come down from the cross likewise all the chief priests mocking him with the scribes and elders said he saved others himself he cannot save if he be the king of israel let him now come down from the cross and we will believe him he trusted in God. Let him deliver him now if he will have him. For he said, I am the son of God. The thieves also, which were crucified with him, cast the same in his teeth. That's old way of saying they told him the same thing. Yeah, why don't you get down off the cross as they hung there and bled also. Matthew 27, 46. This is when it really gets bad. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. And that is to say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And again, for the next few moments, I'm going to preach. Can you see his broken heart? Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray that you'd help us, Lord, to be able to see what you desire communicated this morning. Lord, I know you spoke a clear word to me. Lord, I pray that I wouldn't get in the way of what you desire to say, Lord, but that instead you would use me as a vessel, that you would be the preacher and the teacher, and that you would speak to your people, and that your anointing, Lord God, would minister the truth into their hearts and their minds, and that we would be different when we leave, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You know, the thought that the Lord gave me for this message this morning was that in the end, he was alone. And we can easily see the physical pain and the things that were going on. He was tortured. He was slapped. He was ridiculed. He was hit. He was nailed on the cross. He was mocked. But what about the aloneness? I, you know, I chose aloneness instead of loneliness for a reason. You know, because, because see, you could not be alone yet still be alone. Yeah. That's right. But in this situation, he was alone. In, in this story, his aloneness only got worse before he died. I want you to know that. You know, and there's many times in our lives that we may feel alone. I would say that true Christianity, listen, give me some time to work on this, all right, before you prejudge what I'm saying. I would say that in most circumstances, true Christianity actually can result in feelings of aloneness. The reason why is because the spirit of the world is against the true spirit of Christ. And the spirit of religion is against the true spirit of Christ. Let me make that clear. We just read it. If you didn't catch it, let me tell you. See, those that passed by reviled him. That's just your everyday normal fellow with his family walking by where Rome had all these crosses set up. and they just, That's the world right there. And they just walking by and they reviled him. And then the priests. The scribes, the elders, the Pharisees, then they came by, wagging their head. I don't know what that really means, but I'm imagining if I got some girl at Winn-Dixie, or they ain't got a Winn-Dixie around here, some place mad, she'd be like, oh, no, you didn't. And she start <laughs> wagging her head and throwing her finger up in the air like that. That's what they, I think that's what they do. <laughs> hey, you, 
up there acting like you're going to tear down the temple and you're going to raise it back up again. You can't even get yourself down off the cross. The world and religion are against the real Jesus. Hear me now. I'm not talking about just Hinduism and Buddhism and Islamism. I'm talking, and I'm not just talking about Catholicism. I'm talking about Protestantism. I'm talking about religion that does not lead the people to the real Jesus and trying to formulate some kind of false sense of religion and security to try to tell them that this is Jesus when it ain't even really Jesus. Right. Right. That's another spirit of another kind. Oh, they'll use his name, my friend. Did you not read what Paul wrote in his letter to the Corinthian church? He said, I am concerned that just as the serpent beguiled or deceived Eve, that you too will be led astray from your simple and pure devotion to Christ Jesus. For if he comes preaching another Jesus and has got another spirit, <laughs> it's another gospel. And you may put up. And then later on he says, don't be surprised for if Satan can transform himself into an angel of light. What you think about his ministers? See, there's many a preacher that stand behind this sacred desk and they ain't preaching the truth, my friend. Right. Don't you get mad at me and start turning me off because you don't like my aggravating personality. No, you need to listen and you need to find out I'm supposed to grab a Bible and you're supposed to know is the words that you're hearing Whenever you're watching the preacher lining up with the word of God. And then some people will say, but I don't know if I know the word of God that well. Well, shame on us. That's right. right, Christian? Amen. I'm not saying that to pick on you. I'm just trying to say, shame on us. We need, the word of God says, a workman that rightly divides the word of truth shall not be ashamed. It's your job, it's my job as the people of God to learn the word of God. And the spirit of religion and the spirit of the world is against the Christ. That's right. You know, you could be in a family that doesn't believe the way you believe and you could be alone. You could be in a marriage that doesn't believe, your, your spouse doesn't believe the way you believe and you could be alone. You could be in a workplace, even a church. You could even be in a Protestant church and be alone. If all of a sudden, oh, hallelujah, the rays of light from the Holy Ghost would, would be kind enough to, to light upon your, your shadowed heart. And he would illuminate you to be able to see the truth of his word. And you'd still be in the midst of a congregation of people that can't see. They may even want to see. But they can't see. Don't tell me I've been there, my friend. I've seen it with my own eyes. I, I'm not trying to talk to you about something that I don't know nothing about. I understand that the very, a very large part of being part of the body of Christ is this concept of interconnectedness. Can I use that word? With other believers. A large purpose of being part of a community of believers is the common union that we have together in Jesus, which connects us to the Father through him. And as it is spoken in John 17, Jesus said, I am one with you, Father. I am you, you and me. Now make them one with us. Communion, common union. How do you think you got connected to Jesus? If you don't understand this, you need to, we need a Christianity 101. When you were a sinner and did not know God, you were not connected to God, my friend. And then hopefully you heard some kind of a preacher that said, hey, you're a sinner born of Adam and you need a savior. They don't want to preach this way no more. You know why? Oh, it has to go offend somebody. They're not going to want to come back to church. You think I'm mean? No, I'm just telling the truth. Then I'm going to say the wrong thing and they're not going to like me. Who cares? As long as God likes you, preacher. Yeah. Who called you anyway? The people? Yeah. No. God called you if he called you. And, and, and then if you heard a true gospel and it pricked your heart, what did you say? Lord, I need that. Something wrong with me. I, I need you to save me, Lord. I'm not okay. That's right. And God help us. If we find ourselves sitting in a church for 15, even 20 years, and we ain't never even been saved. Mm -hmm. But yet we thought we were okay. No, let me tell you something, my friend. When you get saved, the Holy Spirit comes to live on the inside of your heart, and he starts rearranging things. Right. 
Amen. I was, I was, I'm not going to get overly zealous this morning, I don't think. But one time I was preaching a message. I remember old James Falls said, oh, brother, that message you preached. It was like the Holy Ghost was a man inside of my heart. He was kicking boxes around. Everything he was kicking, you know. That's how it ought to be. The Lord should she be shaking us up. Because you know what? I'm talking about to the preacher. He should be shaking us up. We get all complacent in this world. Thinking we okay. No, we're not okay. Lord, we need you. And when you get saved and the Holy Spirit comes to live in your heart, he will. He's going to do it his own way. You only got to deal with me two hours a week, friend. Right? And the Holy Spirit's much sweeter than me. He's much kinder. He knows how to do it the right way. I try to be led by him, right? But he, he, he thank God he don't act like me all the time. Amen. Amen? Amen? He can get a whole lot more accomplished in one moment than what I can in an hour. I just hope that he does use me. Amen? You get the point. So this is part of it. A big part of the church is being interconnected and moving closer to him. Amen? Uh, through his body. Meaning that the common goal, though, I want you to know. So while it's true that the large purpose of the body of Christ is to create this believers moving towards a common goal... It's not true that all churches or bodies are interconnecting through his body. Meaning that it's clear the common goal and purpose that the Father and Jesus have is that Jesus would come and give his life on the cross so that we can have new life in him and that through him we can all be connected to the Father. And the main end goal purpose of all this interconnection of God's body to him is so that he will be glorified. Does that make sense? That the end purpose, let me slow down. The end purpose of God connecting all of us together in Christ is so that through us, God will receive glory. Why? Because God wants people to know him. This is not something that just showed up in the New Testament. This is an Old Testament concept. What are you talking about? The children of Israel, God said, when I bring you into that land, and you're around those other people. What other people? The ones that don't know me? They're going to say, this is what they're going to say. They're going to say, what other person is there on earth that has their God so close to them as you do? Why were they going to say that? Because they had the law of God, which is the word of God. And they were going to be able to see how close they were to their God. So when you and I truly get saved and the Holy Spirit comes to live on the inside of our heart and we submit ourselves under the truth of the gospel, what happens is, is that God begins to work in our hearts and in our lives and that through us, he reveals himself to other people. That's right. Amen. Amen. And in the end, he's glorified. Well, okay. Well, the other kind of Christianity is, my name is Jimmy, Lord, what you going to give me? <laughs> Because I'm, I'm in a bind down here, man. I need my electric bill paid. And I need an upgrade on my car. And I need some crown molded in my house. And I need this and I need that. And you the God of all blessing. And I'm a king's kid. And it's time for me to get blessed. And don't tell me that they ain't got it out there. And they're pretty much preaching it almost like I did. Oh, we throw some dollars up on the stage. We're dancing them. We'll make them fly up. We're blessed, man. Look, our feet are blessed coming in. they blessed going out. And he is a God of blessing. And I've seen that to be true. Yes, he is. The main goal and purpose of this is that he would get glory. Yes, you can derive great benefits from having friends and family and co-workers and loved ones that are like-minded and believe like you. It will be of great benefit to your own personal life and can provide a source of happiness and joy. However, let me say this. However, a church that is built on the premise that people have a hole in their heart for human interconnectedness. Listen to me. Let me slow that down. Let me use some different kind of words. A church. A system. I'm going to call it the seeker sensitive church. I'm going to call it the modern church today. I'm just going to go ahead and say it. Because I feel like I'm in that kind of mood. The Rick Warren church. That was developed by Rick Warren. When he knocked on doors. <clears throat> in Saddleback, California. And he asked the world. What can we do in our services to make it more convenient and comfortable for you? And what did the world say? They said, and listen, I don't, I don't care if we ever wear choir robes again, but I don't want the world telling me what we're supposed to do. Oh, get rid of the choir robes, dim the lights, 
Give me some fog machines. Give me some strobe, baby. Give me, you know, make the sermon shorter. Don't say something that's going to make me uncomfortable. Okay, let me check that off. Let me check that off on the list. And now we will create an atmosphere where the world will feel comfortable mm -hmm. coming into the walls of the church. That's a problem, church. Yeah, amen. Amen. That is a problem. Amen. <clears throat> we're going we're gonna to mold the word of God. We're going to change. Because see, and, and then that's what they do. And, don't, and, and again, I've sat under this and I've seen it with my own eyes. So we make that we, we, we believe that there's this hole in our heart and that what we're missing is human companionship or something else. And so what we do is we create our services around filling that void. Listen to me. I'm preaching the truth to you. So I hope you're getting this and you can go back and you can study it over the next several years and find out if it was true. We, we do, and listen, this is not coming from the Holy Ghost. You, you understand that? Again, can I, do I have to repeat it? Paul wrote a letter to the Corinthian church. I'm concerned that just as the serpent deceived Eve, you too may be led astray from your simple and pure devotion to Christ Jesus. For if he comes preaching another Jesus and has got another spirit, it's another gospel. What I'm here to tell you is, is that somebody's either preaching the truth or they're not. Their personality probably won't always look like mine, thank God. But what are they saying? That's right. Are they saying that in order for man to be right with God, the old man born of Adam must die and a new man born of Christ must live and that the cross is an instrument of death? Hallelujah, meaning the old man must die. All those little intricacies. The Lord wants to set you free from drugs and alcohol, but you know why? <laughs> so that he can reach down inside your heart and in your head and he can start correcting all the personality quirks right. that have been jacking you up all your life and offending people. Right. Oh, let them be offended by the word, my friend. Just, Lord, please change me so that's not my personality. That's it. That's it. If they be offended by his word, then so be it. Because they're not going to always like it. <laughs> Do you remember what they did to him? Did we, just, we just read that. Yeah. You see what they did to him? Because I'm trying to tell you, if everybody's loving everything that you're saying, Come on. Oh, don't get me wrong. Though the Holy Ghost will show up at those times, right? And the anointing of the God, of God will, will begin to speak no matter how, how hard the message is. And he will, he will reach into their hearts. But look, a church that does that and, and, and builds a church off of this human desire for companionship as though that were the main missing piece. And we build a social organization around that, this felt need. And our motivation will be connecting people to community, connecting people, the connection church, the connect community. You can see this wording over and over again, connect people to relationships. And in this, we say that our purpose is connecting people to Jesus and doing God's work. But our communication through our music and through our message focuses on some relevant, feel-good, motivational message? No, that's, that's not it. That's, that's not the answer. Right. As a matter of fact, I don't have time to really get so deep into all these details for you. But Rick Warren was actually part of, a big part of the, the mega church thing. And you know what? Since I mentioned Rick Warren, let me finish. If you didn't turn me off, you'll be interested to know this. I learned some stuff when I was in nursing school working on my original, my undergrad degree. I took a management class and I learned about a man named Peter Drucker. Peter Drucker wrote many, many books on quality time management. He was a business person. He ain't had nothing to do with the church. Somehow as I was studying all this stuff and learning the history of all kind of crazy stuff and cut, sniffed out Rick Warren and what he was doing, I realized that Rick Warren spoke at Peter Drucker's funeral. How did these two worlds meet? How did my management learning from nursing school meet with my theological learning? How did this happen? Well, I'm going to tell you how it happened because I saw an interview where the guy is asking Peter Drucker, oh, so you're a believer? No, I'm an atheist. Yeah. He's a Swedish businessman that wrote multiple books. Well, how did you have such an influential part in the creation of the mega church? Oh, well, that's easy. Mm -hmm. I was trying to get companies to buy in to help people socially. Can, have you learned from me yet about the spirit of Babel? About man coming together and helping man without God in their picture? Mm -hmm. Peter Drucker tried to get businesses 
to put their money together to help people socially. And I'm here to tell you that there's another spirit behind that in preparation to help humanity so outside of God. And guess what? The business world rejected him because in the bottom line, when it comes to certain things, companies are here to make money. So what did he do? He reached out to leadership that was in churches and he came up with this idea and he uses scriptures like, when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was naked, you clothed me. And now the two formed an alliance. Wow. And the mega church was birthed. And it's all about this social interconnectedness and bringing people together. And I'm here to tell you, it's another spirit Amen. of another kind exactly. that's creating something. And they call it church. And the people that sit in here and they hear me say this kind of thing, and you might be on video, they don't like it. Because many of them have already sat in churches like this, and they've bought into that message, and it ruffles their feathers, so to speak, and it frustrates them because they can't see it. But I'm here to tell you that the message of the cross, the message of Jesus Christ and Him crucified, is a message where self-will dies, and that by the grace of God and the resurrected spirit on the inside of us, we turn our lives over to Him and in service to Him, and we stay true to the truth. Amen. No, that's a scheme, my friend. It's a scheme that is being pushed by demonic spirits. You know, all I'm trying to encourage people to do is to compare what you hear elsewhere to the Bible, along with prayer that says, Lord, I want your word, not the word of a man. Amen. I want the word of God. The word that may offend me and correct me because more than I want to be right in my own mind, I want God to be right in my mind. Amen? The true word will all help also the one that is alone. Transitioning back to the message. The true word will also help the one that is alone and cannot connect to his life group. <laughs> Have you ever heard that one? You know what I'm saying? Y'all know what I'm talking about? Some of y'all know. Because y'all went to my church. Life groups. That's going to be your connection. See, in a mega church, when you got 5,000 people, you got to figure out a novel idea on how to make sure that you, that you keep those people interested and to keep them there. So what you do is you create smaller groups. I'm not saying there's a problem with smaller groups. I wish we had more strong leadership or, or let me just say this. That's not even true. I wish we had more people that were interested in studying the Bible more and getting together on another day of the week. And okay, so, but, 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 but nevertheless, let's just stay focused. So what they do is, is that whenever they're larger and they're, and they're building these, they build programs to give the people a sense of, of meaning and cohesiveness. I, I have a meaning here in this, in this church. I, I, I have a function. So I belong here. All right. And, and, and so, so, but now what do you do when you can't get a hold of your life group leader? What, what, what do you do whenever your best friend won't answer the phone? What do you do when the preacher fell asleep and turned his phone on vibrant? What you going to do whenever your life is falling apart and you can't, you can't meet up with your life group. That's why it doesn't work, my friend, because the truth of the gospel wants to teach us how to get a hold of Jesus. The job of the pastor, you know, that's what the word disciple means, a learner of Christ. Yes, it may happen quickly. And listen, I don't want to take away from the importance of other believers that know the Lord and that can help us in our journey because that is important. But that is not what a church is supposed to be built on. A church is supposed to be built on the rock that is Christ Jesus. You know, and, and the truth that what he did for me will give me praise, a grace that I need to live for him on this earth. Amen. Amen. Whether in a group, whether in a air conditioned room like this. Or in a mine on the Isle of Patmos in the Mediterranean Sea, as I've been arrested for for preaching the gospel, John the Beloved. In his incarceration in the book of Revelation. Or in a dark dungeon dug out in the city of Rome called the Mamertine Prison. And your name is Paul. And tomorrow you die. 
Tomorrow, Emperor Nero will have someone call your name and you will be marched out of your dark dungeon and you will walk and your head will be removed from your body. Whether you be in an air-conditioned room or whether you be in a dark dungeon all by yourself or whether you be in a mine banished, it doesn't matter where you are. Because the joy of the Lord is your strength. Oh, are you going to be happy? You're not going to be happy because your circumstances are going to be bad. But the joy of the Lord, hallelujah. I'm talking about a real presence from God will be living inside of your heart. And that no matter what you face and no matter what you go through, you just, he's just one whisper away. That's why I want to encourage you to get to know him. I want to encourage you to get to know him. I want to encourage you in your home if you have a guitar, if you have a, a worship song that you can play, that you get to know him, that you play to him, that you that you sing to him, that you tell him that you're, that you're thankful for him and that you get to know him for when you need him. Amen. You'll be able to connect to him. Hallelujah. That is the Jesus I want to talk to you about this morning real quick. I want to talk to you about something Specific. I want to talk to you about the aloneness that he suffered for in your place. I want to talk to you about the fact that he suffered and was alone. You yourself will never have to be alone. You hear me now? You don't have to be alone. What, what are you talking about? Because he will always be one yeah. whisper away. Yes. He will always be poised and ready to run to you. Right now, wherever you are in your life, he's been poised and ready to run to you. Can I just say this? He waits to hear you say his name. Amen? Amen? I want you to believe me when I tell you this. The Lord is poised and ready and he's waiting to hear you say his name. Just whisper it. Whisper his name. You know what? Instead of the name of another man, if you're a woman. Instead of the name of another woman, if you're a man. Instead of the name of another type of brand of alcohol. Instead of the name of some new drug. Instead of the name of some new church, I may try a new church. Instead of the name of some new preacher. Instead of the name of something new. No, Jesus, I need you. <laughs> Jesus, I need you. He's poised and he's ready. But that empty spot in my heart keeps telling me to go somewhere else. And every time I go there, I'm left empty. I'm left broken. I'm left hurting. And I wish that I had a better message for you this morning to tell you that if you just give your heart to Jesus, you ain't never going to feel another bad day. There'll never be another gloomy day in the sky. There'll never be clouds in the sky, my friend. And if they are, they'll be white and fluffy. No, that's not reality. Reality is this world is fallen. Man is fallen. But God is so good. God is so good that he gave you his son, Jesus. And if you just surrender to him, the Holy Spirit will live in you. And that no matter what you're going through, because you know what? Tomorrow you got to get up and go to work, right? Somebody help me out. You got to go to work. I don't know where y'all work. Tomorrow I'm going to be working in a hospital. All right. Some of y'all will be working in the roofing industry. Some of y'all be working somewhere else. And have you not noticed that some of them other people... Got some really bad ways about them. I know. I know you got it all figured out. I got it all figured out. We're, you know, but, but but those other people that we got to deal with, man, they can be irritating. Danielle said, "Yeah, I got to wake up and listen to you tomorrow." <laughs> I see you back there. <laughs> He's working on me. He's gonna change. You just keep praying. Amen. He's still working. Praise God. But that's what I'm trying to say. It's never gonna be perfect. I'm trying to get that through our thick heads, my thick head, <laughs> because listen, if not, we get disenfranchised, we get confused, we don't understand why the sun's not shining brighter, why the, the, the skies aren't without clouds, because it ain't going to be that way, my friend. This world is fallen. People are fallen. God wants to give you the grace that you need to live in front of living. Amen. If you could consider the passages that we read regarding Jesus' aloneness and how it progressively worsened, it started in the garden when he just needed his disciples to tarry and just to pray for a little while longer. You know, he's still asking us to tarry here and to pray. But many times, I think we could all admit it, we kind of fall asleep like them disciples. Falling asleep on the job. 
What, what does it mean to be awake? This is my definition. You may not agree with this. Awake to the fact that when you drive down the road and every car that passes you is a soul. Awake to the fact that when you drive through a trailer park to go pick somebody up and there's a hundred trailers in that trailer park, every single trailer probably represents anywhere from two to five souls. And them souls, without Jesus, you might think I'm a crazy preacher, but I'm telling you the word of God says, they won't have to receive Jesus. We don't have time to philosophize on why this and all that right now. I'll be more than happy to do it with you to this afternoon at the church. Write your questions down and we'll talk about it. I mean, at the, at the uh, party at five. Write your questions down and we'll talk about it. But what I'm trying to say is, is that that's what the Lord wants us to, to see because that's what he sees. And then they all fled. As the guards grabbed him and bound him, his disciples scattered in all directions. They left him. Peter said, oh, I'm not going to leave you, Lord, but then he did. And then the crowd said, we want Barabbas. You know, the world's still saying that kind of thing right now. We want Barabbas. Well, I wish I could really preach on Barabbas right now. His name Barabba means son of God. Dude, is that not weird? Son of God. Bar means son. Abba means God. Son of God. Is that not weird? Because I'm just trying to say that here's the true son of God. Here's son of God. This is like representative of a fallen man. This is the one that God gave. And the crowd says, give us this one. If this is what God is offering, I want the murderous lying thief. I want somebody help me with that. Yeah. Come on. Do, do, you know, do you know that in the end, whenever the Antichrist comes, we've been studying all this, that God's going to allow people to be deceived? And you know why it says that? Because they rather a lie than the truth. That's right. The people wanted the lie. They what they what they really did want. They just didn't want what Jesus wanted. Give us Barabbas, and then they put him on the cross. And the world and religion passed by, wagging their heads, and they ridiculed. And they said, "You can't even get yourself down off the cross." How, if you could, then we would believe you. No, you wouldn't, because guess what? They brought him down off the cross, and not only that, he rose from the dead. And they still didn't believe him, and they still don't believe him. And no, you wouldn't, sir, because half the time you're working with people because God strategically places people in your path that have Jesus in their heart, and he's alive in their heart, and you still don't believe. So that's why it's so important for you and I to let Jesus be alive in our heart. So that they can see and have the opportunity to believe. But then it got worse. Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is to say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It got really bad at that moment, my friend. Jesus no longer felt the presence of the Father. Now, I really struggled with that for a long time because I really just didn't understand it. And now it's so simple. I believe that I have the key. And I know many of you have shared it with you before, but this is the thing. You got to remember that it was not Jesus' sin on why the Father turned his head. Come on. It was your sin. My sin. It was laid upon our Savior. And because of that, the Father turned his head from the most beautiful thing that this earth has ever seen. Not pretty in the sense of physical appearance because Isaiah 53 51 said, 53 said that he was not pretty. That we would relish him. Yeah, like, like the way that he looked. But that instead, oh no, but he's beautiful. <laughs> and any heart and eye that's been open to it knows what I'm talking about. <coughs> he is altogether wonderful. So he was left all alone right there on that cross. And one of the biggest reasons that I believe that it happened that way was so that you will never have to be alone. Amen. I want you to know that. Oh, but that's not true, preacher, because I feel lonely. I didn't talk about loneliness. You might have missed it, but guess what? The Apostle Paul was in a dungeon and he was never alone. That's right. John was on the Isle of Patmos being forced to mine for the cause of God. Mine whatever, I don't know what. Digging out coal or diamonds. And he was never alone. He's always one whisper away. So no matter where your choices in life bring you. Oh, but the hole in my heart is because I need a girlfriend. 
The hole in my heart is because I got to do what everybody else is doing. And everybody else is, is, is getting married and having kids and having grandkids. And they're getting two, you know, they got two nice cars and crown molding in their living room. What is your problem with crown molding, preacher? <laughs> everybody else is doing it. Well, guess what? Israel said we want to be like everybody else. Give us a king. God will give you what you ask for and what you demand. And all I'm trying to say is this. Once you get what you thought you had to have, and it doesn't fill that hole. Well, wait, I'm a Christian. That's not what I'm talking about. You can be a Christian and you still feel like you got a hole. And you run in and searching and you go into and fro and you're looking for that thing to fill that hole up in your heart. And once you get that little thing that you think is going to fill that hole up and you realize that that hole is still there. Just remember, I can't say, call on his name. Call on his name. How's it go? Jesus. I, I don't even know the rest of the words. Call on his name. Yeah. Jesus. Well, I'm going to just say, make my own song. Whisper his name. Jesus. Holler his name. <laughs> Jesus. It, 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 he's the answer that you're looking yes, for. Yes. Amen. I don't know how else to say it. He's the answer that we're looking for. But I thought I had him. I'm not saying you don't have him. You need more of him. There, you're not going to find another answer for the hole in your heart. We may not, we may not re be removed by the Holy Ghost from this earth on this side of glory. I don't know when the end is coming. You and I might go to sleep in Christ. But I'm here to tell you. who. Why should I believe you, preacher? I don't really know. But I'm here to tell you. You're not going to find another thing to put in that hole that you right. sometimes feel in your heart. That's right. Whisper his name. That's it. No matter where you end up, no matter how many things you try to put in there, each time you put something else in there and you realize that it didn't fill the hole, just remember what this old crazy preacher said and whisper his name. Oh, but surely this will do it. I used to work with a girl. I'm telling you right now. She had seven dogs and she had a box full of money. And I wasn't doing it. So what she did, she went and bought a Corvette. And the Corvette couldn't do it. So she went and bought some other kind of sports car. And that didn't do it. So she joined the Orchid Society. And she didn't just join. She ended up taking it over. And then and then she did this. And, and, and then she did that. And, and she kept doing stuff. And you know what the reality of it is? Is that she needed Jesus. Yeah. She'd pour her whole life into everything that she did. But always we had a church of folk like that. Amen. Can I get the musicians to come back up? The main point I wanted to make today was that his heart was broken. His heart was broken and he was truly alone like no other ever will be. Because you know why? God does not have to forsake you because Jesus was forsaken for your sin. I was, I'm sorry, Jesus was forsaken for your sin. Jesus was forsaken for my sin. Amen? So the main point I wanted to make today was that his heart was broken and he was truly alone, <coughs> like no other ever will be. Y'all can just softly kind of play, maybe just strum the guitar because I got a little bit more reading to do here. So that your heart could be healed. He was left alone because of sin, because of our sin, so that God could come to us in spite of our sin. I want to close by reading a whole psalm, Psalm 27. As they're strumming their guitars, I'm just going to read this psalm, and then we're going to just let them play a worship song. If you need prayer, the altars are open. Amen. If nothing else, we're just going to worship the Lord together before we close. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even my enemies and my foes, came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Though a host or an army should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me, in this will I be confident. One thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me upon a rock. 
And now shall my head be lifted up above my enemies round about me. Therefore will I offer in his tabernacle sacrifices of joy. I will sing, yea, I will sing praises unto the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice. Have mercy also upon me and answer me. When you said, seek ye my face, my heart said unto you, your face, Lord, will I seek. Hide not your face far from me. Put not your servant away in anger. You have been my help. Leave me not. Neither forsake me, O God of my salvation. When my father and mother forsake me, then the Lord will take me up. Teach me your way, O Lord. Lead me in a plain path because of my enemies. Deliver me not over to the will of my enemies. For false witnesses are risen up against me. And such as breathe out cruelty. I had fainted. Let me say that again. I had fainted unless I had believed. That means I would have quit. I would have threw in the towel. Unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage. And he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Let's worship the Lord. Amen.